been thinking about this topic for a little while, the mind of Christ. And I guess the challenges that face our brains and our thinking and our minds. Because we live in an age, don't we, where more than really any other time, our minds are, are really under enormous pressure. We live in an age, at the end of an age, where we are being bombarded by advertising and marketing, by peer pressure, by materialism, by this exponential rate of change that our brains are struggling to cope with. We live in a world that is desperately trying through the news, through, through shopping malls, advertising, the internet, magazines, fashion, the movies, to try and conform us, conform our minds to be like it. And we desperately, brothers and sisters, at least I hope we do, desperately want to be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this titanic struggle going on for our minds. And we have to ask these questions. How important is the mind of Christ to us? Do we want it? How do we get it? What is stopping us from getting it? What does it look like, the mind of Christ? How do we grow up into him? These are questions that that I think all of us want to be asking and want to know the answers to. So I want to start tonight with a really lovely quote from, uh, from the letter to the Ephesians by Brother John Carter. And this is what he says on page 133. <clears throat> the mind is insensibly affected by the stream of thought passing through it. It is desirable, therefore, to have that stream of thought as pure as possible. And insensibly affected means that whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, our mind is going to be affected by the things that we think about. And we're going to talk in our series about the mind of Christ. And what we want in our mind is the things of Christ. But our mind is going to be insensibly affected. Whether we like it or not, whether we want it to be or not, it's going to be affected by the things that we think about. So how important is this subject? It is vitally important for us. Um, I just want to look up uh, four New Testament passages just to illustrate this point by way of introduction. Just one verse from each. Mark chapter 12. If you just come with me to these verses quickly. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. When one of the scribes came in Mark chapter 12 and verse 28 and asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered and said, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So what Christ is saying here in Mark chapter 12 is that our mind is critically important. What happens in our mind is really a summary of what all of the law is about. It's about serving God with our mind. That's the law of Moses. You'll know this reference, Philippians 2 verse 5. It's probably the most well-known reference about the mind of Christ. And we'll come back here at some later stage. But it says in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Having the mind of Christ is quite simply the essence of life in the truth. What about Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16? Hebrews says there, or Paul says in Hebrews talking about the new covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And he's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31 where Jeremiah talks about the new covenant. And he talks about how God offered up Pharaoh's only son and brought Israel out of Egypt. And he wrote the law of Moses on tables of stone. And it didn't work, brothers and sisters. It didn't affect the people. It didn't change them. And God said, 
I'm going to have to crucify my own son in order to write my law on people's minds. It's the very reason Hebrews 10 says our Lord was sacrificed to get the law of God into our hearts and minds. That's where God wants it. It's vitally important. And if you didn't think that was enough, our reading tonight in Romans chapter 8 says, for to be carnally minded is death. And to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we're thinking along the lines of the flesh, we cannot please God. It is impossible to please him. Impossible. It reminds us, doesn't it, of Hebrews 11 verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Here it says, without a spiritual mind, it is impossible to please God. It's just as essential as faith in our lives. Our lives and the truth are all about this subject. It's the difference between life and death. It's all about our minds. Everything else that we have is going to decay, gather dust, corrupt, either be bought or sold or stolen. Even our bodies are highly corruptible. But our mind is extremely precious to God. God can change our bodies, and he's promised to do that, hasn't he? In the twinkling of an eye, that's not really a problem. But God can't change our minds. We have to change our minds. Do you know in Proverbs 10 and verse 20, it says in the Revised Standard Version, the mind of the wicked is of little worth. The mind of the wicked is of little worth worth proverbs 10 verse 20 and the implication from that verse is really that the mind of the righteous must be extremely valuable to god extremely precious to him so this subject that we're going to look at together the mind of christ is not really a peripheral subject is it without minimizing anything else that we look at or study this is not a question of well was jephthah Jephthah's daughter sacrificed or dedicated? What's the significance of the 153 fish? Was Moses and Elijah really resurrected to be on the Mount of Transfiguration? This is not a peripheral subject. This is the essence of the truth. The mind of Christ. This is what it's all about. It's at the heart of everything we do, developing this mind. It is vitally important that we understand these things. It's life and death. So, how do we plan to look at this topic? Now, I'm sure that if I asked all of you, there would be probably uh, a couple of dozen ways that if I asked you to, you would approach this subject of looking at the mind of Christ. So I ask for your forgiveness if it's not what you expect over the next few weeks. But this is how I want to look at things uh, together. Tonight, we want to look at the carnal mind and really establish together the problem that all of us have. Hopefully there'll be something that we learn out of tonight about the way that we think, how our brain operates. We all have this this terrible, horrible problem. We all have it in common. It's called the carnal mind, and we want to look at that tonight, because unless we understand that, we're not going to be able to understand anything else. But we're trying to go from here towards a spiritual mind. So in our second class, we're going to look at What is a spiritual mind and how is that going to be God's antidote to what we inherit naturally from Adam and Eve? Then in our third class, we want to look at the process of going from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind. That's what the Bible calls the renewing of our minds. We want to look at that that process of metamorphosis. What is it like? How does it happen? And lastly, we want to look at the end at more particularly, the mind of Christ. We're never going to get there, brothers and sisters, on this continuum, this journey of life. We're never going to get to a spiritual mind or the mind of Christ. But the only way we can get there is by practice. So we want to look at what it is like to be 
be like Christ in the way that we think. So a little caveat about tonight. Tonight is not going to be particularly exhortational. Um, tonight is going to outline for us the problem. We're going to have uh, study two, three, and four to look at the solution. But tonight I want to just um, to ask for a little bit of your time just to establish the problem that all of us have. We'll look at the solution as time goes by. But tonight we want to look at the problem that we have because we all need to realize, brothers and sisters, that we have leprosy. We are desperately sick. We're blind. We're lame. We're blemished. We're crippled. We all have a deformity, a disability. And it's called the carnal mind. It's not our fault. It's our misfortune, not our crime. But we need to know what it is, how it works, see it for what it is, and how it's sabotaging our spiritual lives before we can, before we can strive after something that's infinitely better. Before we can be cured and healed and restored by Christ, we've got to understand what, what is the enemy that we're facing, the carnal mind. So let's just start with the basics and we're going to go right back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and the formation of man and woman. We know these verses pretty well, but let's just read them together. Genesis 1 verses 26 to 28. <clears throat> and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so it was God's intention, was it not, from the beginning of time that man and woman were to have dominion. In fact, it's there twice in those verses. It's there in verse 26, let them have dominion. It's there in verse 28, and have dominion. Over all of the animals in the animal kingdom, man was to have dominion, was to have authority, to exercise dominion. And to do that, they were given, the man and the woman, two attributes. They were made in the image and the likeness of God. And we understand image to be really referring to the physical form or shape of human beings. Physically, we look like the angels. But likeness, we understand to be mental capacity, the way that we can be like God. And this is what Brother Thomas says in Alpha's Israel. While image then hath reference to form and shape, likeness hath regard to mental constitution or capacity. From the shape of his head, as compared with other creatures... It is evident that man has a mental capacity that distinguishes him above them all. Their likeness to him is faint. They can think, but their thoughts are only sensual. They have no moral sentiments or higher intellectual aspirations. Adam's mental capacity enabled him to comprehend and receive spiritual ideas, which moved him to veneration, hope, conscientiousness, etc., and we know that mental capacity really refers to this ability to be like God because when Paul is going to quote this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 7, he translates image and likeness as image and glory. And we know from Exodus that the glory of God was the character of God. Really, it's, it's a description of our ability to emulate God's character it's our mental capacity to think like the Elohim, to think like God, to have a mind that could grasp eternal spiritual ideas. And so it was God's plan, his intention, right from Genesis 1, that there would be a people who would think like him, who would have his mind, his thoughts. And making the human race to look like God happened in almost an instant of time. But the quest for a select remnant, a group of people who think like God, 
Now that's a different proposition. That's a 7,000 year plan. But it was this ability to think like God that should really have enabled Adam and Eve to have dominion over the animal kingdom. Now, we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent deceived Eve and sin entered the world. And we're going to look at that a little more in our second uh, class. But I just want to look at the result. We know this verse probably better than any verse in the Bible. Genesis 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head or he shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. So the outcome of sin entering the world was a conflict, enmity, a battle, a hostility. Now before, there was peace that existed in the Garden of Eden. But now, that is disrupted. There used to be two people who just thought like God. Now... That has been violated. Now there are two wills. There's God's will and God's word. And there is the serpent's will and the serpent's word. One of them is the truth. One of them is a lie. And Eve was going to choose the lie. And Adam was going to follow. And so Genesis 3.15 gives us two ways. The way of the serpent and the way of the woman and their respective seeds. Now, we know this, but let's just refresh our minds and, and just see if we can establish why we're looking at this verse in the context of the carnal mind. <clears throat> so here we have Genesis 3.15. We've got, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman. There was going to be a battle, a conflict. And between thy seed and the woman's seed, there was going to be a battle. Now we understand, don't we, brothers and sisters, that this was not really the prophecy of females fighting eternal, an, an eternal fight against snakes or serpents. This is, not, this is not that kind of battle. This is a battle for the thinking that Eve had and the thinking that the serpent had. And we know that because... Because of the way that the word enmity is used in the scriptures. This enmity between the serpent and the woman is going to come up again later in the scriptures. Romans 8 verse 7, we just read it. The carnal mind is enmity with God. There's a carnal mind and a spiritual mind. Two ways of thinking. And they are enmity with each other. Galatians 5 is going to say, The flesh lusteth against the spirit. And these are the contrary one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Galatians 5 verse 7. There is a contrariness, an antagonism, a battle between these two ways of thinking. In James 4 verse 4. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. This is, this is the enmity that Genesis 3 verse 15 is going to talk about. It's going to talk about the battle between two different ways of thinking. Those that believe the serpent's lie. Because he told a lie and was the father of it, John 8 verse 44 says. And those that believe the truth, as Eve first put it forward in her simplicity, as 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says. So that's the the struggle of Genesis 3.15. That's the problem. But the solution was also going to be in the verse, because it was going to prophesy of a he that was going to come. He was going to crush the head of the serpent. And we know that this bruising had two aspects. There was the temporary bruising of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Isaiah 53 says, he will be bruised for our iniquities. It pleased Yahweh to bruise him. But it was only temporary, only a wound to the heel, whereas the crushing of the serpent's head was going to be permanent. Our Lord Jesus Christ partook of the same, that through death he might destroy, destroy, permanently crush him that has the power of death, that is the devil. Now we understand, don't we, brothers and sisters, that in our lives we start here, don't we? We start here, but all of us want to end up here as the seed of the woman. And how do we do that? How do we go from being a seed of the serpent naturally to a seed of the woman? And the answer is, 
through baptism. And through baptism, we go from being in Adam to being in Christ. And we align ourselves, don't we, not with those that believe the lie, but with those that believe the truth. Those that believe that the serpent needs to be permanently crushed and then we can rise with Christ to everlasting life. We understand this. This is first principles. But what about our thinking after we've been baptised? Is our thinking cured? Well, we know, brothers and sisters, that baptism is just really the start of a process of being in Christ. When we're baptised, certainly we are in Christ constitutionally from God's perspective. But that does not mean, brothers and sisters, that we suddenly have cured our mind. I'd like you to come to 1st of Corinthians in chapter 3. 1st <clears throat> of Corinthians in, in chapter 3. Look what it says here, just an interesting phrase in this context. And I, brethren, verse 1, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now these people are baptized, they're in Christ, but they're just babies, Paul says, and they're carnal. Sure, they've been baptized and constitutionally they've gone into Christ but they've still got the carnal mind to contend with and they still need to, as Ephesians 4 verse 15 says, grow up into him who is our head. So constitutionally, when we're baptized, we are counted as being in Christ, but that process of really being in him, of thinking like him, is really the effort of a lifetime. We still have enmity inside our own minds. We've inherited from Adam and Eve, a mind that is contrary to God, at enmity with him. And despite being baptized, despite having access to forgiveness, we have this serious, debilitating, crippling disease that even the waters of baptism does not remove from us. It's called the carnal mind. It's not subject to the law of God, we read in Romans 8, Neither indeed can it be. It can't be rehabilitated. It can't be changed. It can't be healed. It can't be cured. It can't be restored. It can't be fixed. It will respond only to crucifixion. It must be put to death. It is serpent thinking. It cannot be rehabilitated. This is our problem. This is what we face Inside our own minds. This is what we have. Do you know in Isaiah 65 and verse 25, in a vision of the kingdom, it says that all the animals uh, are going to undergo some kind of radical change in the kingdom. The wolf is going to lie down with the lamb. So the wolves are no longer going to eat sheep. The lion's going to eat straw like the ox. So the lion's going to change its diet. And then it says, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. Nothing has changed. For the serpent, even in the kingdom, nothing has changed. It ate dust in Genesis 3. It's eating dust in Isaiah 65 and verse 25 in the kingdom. It is unchanged. This is what we have to contend with. It's a serious problem. We have a carnal mind that is directly opposed to God. We can't heal it. We can't cure it. We can't educate it. It has to be crushed. But in order to do that, I'm going to propose to you tonight that it's extremely helpful to know what the carnal mind is, <clears throat> what does it look like, and how does it, how does it work. So, I want to talk a little bit for a few minutes about the physiology of the brain. And if you know this, then uh, that's great. If you don't, you might find something hopefully interesting. <clears throat> uh, neuroscientists in the 1960s really came up with this idea that the the brain that we have has three distinct sections. Firstly, the reptilian brain down the bottom. It's this section right here. Then the mammalian brain, which is this middle section right here. And finally, this large section around the top, the neocortex. Three parts, three divisions to the human brain. 
Now, these are called by the neuroscientists <clears throat> the reptile brain, the mammal brain, and the human brain. And we know that there, there are basic differences between humans, mammals, and reptiles. And this division really is going to use the characteristics of these animals to describe the functions of these different parts of the brain. Clearly, a human is different from a horse or a dog. You can have a conversation with a human. You can't really have a meaningful conversation with a dog or a horse. There's a different type of brain. And you might be game enough to feed your dog or horse in your hand with food and, and, and feed it from your hand. You're certainly not going to do that to an alligator. There's a difference between a horse, a mammal, and a reptile. And those different animals have different characteristics, and these different parts of the brain have different, different functions and responses as well. <clears throat> so what you're looking at right here is actually a, a, a very accurate anatomical cross-section of the devil, the carnal mind. So this is what it looks like. And what we want to do is just go through these three different uh, parts of the brain and see how this works. So first of all, the reptilian brain down here, it's, uh, it's got these different parts, the basal ganglia, the brainstem, and the cerebellum, and it's responsible for these responses, very basic survival instincts, aggression, dominance. It's about hunger and feeding. It takes care of temperature control, sexuality, mating, exploration mainly for food, and lastly, control of territory. This is what reptiles are like. They're, they're usually by themselves, and they're absorbed with these kind of functions. The reptile brain is all about feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. It's really the instinctive part of our brain. It's what Brother Thomas calls propensities. Propensities. This is the serpent brain. We all have it. Secondly... We have the mammal brain. It has these particular parts, the hypothalamus, hippocampus, and the amygdala. It's going to be in control of nurturing the young, of caring, of memories, very important, of social cooperation, of pain or pleasure, of protection, of learning. And it's really where we combine our memories and our emotions. This is the middle part of our brain. It's really the emotional part of our brain. It's what Brother Thomas calls intellect. So, so far we've got an instinct brain, and now we have an emotional brain. And lastly, we're going to have this large section around the top. It makes up 70% of our brain. It's called the neocortex it's going to be in control of language, of abstract concepts like faith and righteousness. It's going to be in control of perception, planning, logical reasoning, decision making. This is the thinking part of our brain. This is where we think and analyze and make critical decisions. It's involved in foresight, hindsight, and insight. This is where we reason and plan and worry and invent. This is what makes us human, as distinct from the animals. It's the analytical brain. It's what Brother Thomas calls moral sentiments. Now, you can probably see, just from going through that little list, the problem that we face. And that is that there's going to be really a distinction between these different parts of the brain and how they act. Now, here's the problem. This part of the brain, the reptilian part, or the instinctive part of our brain, is going to react in 0.2, or 0 to 2, sorry, milliseconds. So, almost instantaneously, this part of our brain is going to react to anything that comes across our path. A threat of safety, danger... Anything that happens, we're going to instinctively react. But this analytical part of the brain up here, first of all, it takes almost a second to kick into gear. And when it starts making decisions, it takes 200 milliseconds to process data, 100 times longer than this instinctive reptilian part at the base of our brains. 
So the analytical part of our brain that's going to make all the decisions is activated almost a second later and takes a hundred times longer to process information. And it gets worse. Because if the reptilian brain here is activated in some way, it's going to monopolize all the blood in the brain. And if you feel like you need to f uh, fight or flee, it's going to draw all the brain from the top part of you, all the blood from the top part of your brain and send it to your muscles and to your heart so that you can start um, action. So what that means is that when we have this instinctive reaction, we really can't think because the top thinking part of our brain is drained of blood. And then as the instinctive brain fires up, we have shallow, fast breathing and the blood goes to the muscles and we have even less oxygen to the brain. So we can see the problem. We have an analytical brain at the top that makes up 70% of our brain, but it needs this rich supply of oxygen and nutrients to work, and it's getting nothing. It's not getting anything. There's no thinking going on. There's only a carnal mind, an instinctive mind, a serpent mind that's been activated and is working. So the carnal mind, brothers and sisters, really from an anatomical perspective is really this bottom section and maybe the emotions part of our brain. It's our brain with the top thinking part shut down, hijacking the oxygen and nutrients getting to the part of our brain that can think. And we can see this process in ourselves. Someone um, might come in, let's say right here and right now, run into the hall and stand right in front of me and say something particularly nasty or uh, particularly threatening. My first instinctive reaction might be to, to punch him, all right? because that's my reptilian brain, and, and I actually did that once when I was a, uh, at high school. Uh, to my, so I apologize for that, bringing out my sins, but we do these things. It's a reptilian brain. The second thing we might do is we get angry. Our emotions get involved, so we might yell or say something nasty. And then maybe a few minutes or hours or days later, we cool down and all of those neurochemicals change and, and we feel terrible about our reaction. And we apologize and we say, I'm so sorry, I, it's not really like me. And those three parts of the brain, you can see how those, they can be activated just in a moment of time. Our thinking brain can get hijacked. It needs time and oxygen and it got neither in that situation. And... and and when that happens to us, we can just be almost powerless over our own thinking. So, now the sad reality is that neuroscientists say that the instinctive and emotional brain take care of around 95% of thinking. Now you think about how scary that suddenly is. We're most of the time, brothers and sisters, on autopilot. We're getting up, we're hungry, we eat, we hop in the car, we drive. Sometimes you don't remember where you've driven for the last five minutes, right? You're taking in all this information, but we're on autopilot. We're not actually thinking. And sadly, our thinking brain can be responsible for as little as 5% of function, and in some people, probably a lot less. So this is why advertising works, because really it's programming the carnal mind. If there's enough exposure that stimulates the reptile brain, you'll buy. You will engage and you'll react <clears throat> in a way that's greedy and so forth. So how do we know this is happening to us? Well, there's some classic signs that tell us that the carnal mind is happening. Sudden onset of clumsiness, butterflies, hot flushes, breathlessness, racing pulse. I want you to think, brothers and sisters, of the last time you felt any of those things. Sudden onset of clumsiness, breathlessness, racing pulse, butterflies in the stomach. That's going to be the time when the carnal mind was extremely aroused and active. This is what it looks like. These are its classic signs and symptoms. <clears throat> It only takes a trigger to shoot off this reptilian side of our brain and, and hijacks our, our thinking brain, and suddenly we're gone. You think about this. Road rage. 
It might be a threat to our safety. Someone pulls right in front of us. It might be they are pulling into my lane. We have this, this idea of territory like the road belongs to us. Or we feel our dominance in the queue is threatened. This is our reptilian brain being activated. All of these things on the screen. And we get angry. It stimulates our aggression. And we react violently and, and unreasonably. That's road rage. That's the reptilian carnal mind. What about if you're faced with the prospect of power, of dominance, of a promotion, control over other people, coming into big money, it stimulates your greed. And you do irrational things to get what you want. That's the carnal mind. What about, what about images which, are, which uh, involve lust? It stimulates this part of our brain. And we do irrational things. We've all been a teenager and seen that pretty girl and had this sudden onset of clumsiness, right? That's what we all have. That's the reptilian carnal mind. What about today's obsession with self-image? It stimulates jealousy. The marketers know how to stimulate this, this very basic instinct in us. And it shuts down our thinking brain and overpowers us and people will spend thousands of dollars on plastic surgery to look better when it has no relevance has no importance in how they feel. What about food? It stimulates pleasure and greed, and we eat. If you're a man, you might have just eaten. You might even be full, but you smell those pastry pies, and you eat. That's what we do. It's an instinctive part of our brain. This is why advertising and marketing is so successful and can manipulate us so easily. They advertise products by attractive, successful people, either wearing or holding their products, and our reptilian brain wants to be like them. In fact, we want to be better than them, and we're deceived into thinking that if we buy that watch or that car or that coat, we will be like them. This is the carnal mind. This is our enemy. It's the enemy that, that we fight against every day. It's a simple case of our neocortex not being activated and the brain hijacking or sabotaging itself. Just a couple of points before we get back to the scriptures about our emotions, which you, <clears throat> you might find interesting and helpful. This middle part of the brain, <clears throat> the emotional part, is really called the limbic system and it's very loosely connected to reality. In fact, often... Not at all. This is where we get sudden memories or deja vu. It comes from this central part of the brain. It's extremely unreliable in terms, of, in terms of dictating our decision making. And that's because this middle part of the brain can either be affected by instinct driving upwards or our thinking brain driving downwards. And we never really know which. So our emotions are extremely unreliable in terms of telling us how to think. And if we're, if we're controlled more by the thinking side of our brain, we can be cold and heartless and analytical, impervious to pain or pleasure. And if our emotions are controlled by our instincts, very often we can become addicted to something. An addiction, very simply, is this central part of the brain combining with the emotions. So the instinct and the emotions combining. Mostly, of course, pleasurable emotions. And what happens is this amygdala down the bottom is going to send out a flood of dopamine, which is a pleasure neurochemical to the brain. And what it tells us is that we're, we're having a wonderful time. So, and what that does is it shuts down, that neurochemical shuts down our thinking brain. Absolutely shuts it down. So suddenly, we're, we're in real trouble. You get a dopamine hit and you just can't think. So just to give you a little bit of an example about that, and just you know, think about this. Someone who's, who's, uh, who's got a problem with gambling. They go along to, to the casino. They have this primeval lust for greed and money and success. And then along with this reptilian brain, they have this amazing emotional high and this dopamine when they put the the chip into the pokey machine and they win a thousand dollars and it feels amazing 
And this emotional part of the brain connects with the reptilian, greedy part of the brain and forms a memory that is extremely hard to break. The front part of our brain, the thinking part, is, is shut down. And suddenly, we can't think. We don't think, well, casinos only exist because they make money in the end and the patrons always lose. We can't think that this is not a responsible way to spend the family's paycheck. We just put another chip into the pokey machine because we want that, that dopamine high. This is addiction. The brain is shut down. And later, once the money's gone and those neurochemicals are gone, we feel terrible and we apologize and we say, I, oh, I, don't, I don't know, I wasn't really thinking. And you weren't really thinking. We don't think this part of our brain is going to be taken over by the carnal mind. This really is our problem, our battle. So, let's see how this looks in the scriptures. Second of Timothy in chapter 3. This is a list of characteristics that's really a description of the carnal mind. And maybe now this is going to make good sense. Second of Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of the sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. This is the corrupt carnal mind, a portrait of what it looks like. It's void of judgment. That's what the word reprobate means. And look at the things that stand out. Number one, lovers of self. That's why that's the reptilian brain. It's all about us. And lovers of pleasure. This is a perfect description of the carnal mind. So think back to what God did. His purpose for us was to have dominion over the animal kingdom. But we lost that dominion when Eve believed a reptile. Since then, we've conquered every animal. We've hunted many into extinction. But there's one, brothers and sisters, that we can't tame, we can't cure, we can't subdue, we can't conquer. It's our own reptilian brain that we fight against each day. And look at this description of it. It's a lover of self. That's the number one characteristic. That's exactly what the serpent said. You don't need to worry, Eve. You won't die. In fact, you're going to be like the angels. Far from dying, you're going to be elevated, Eve. Lovers of self and lovers of pleasure. Look how delicious the fruit looks, Eve. It tastes amazing. Treat yourself. It's just the carnal mind. Do you know it's amazing how strong the carnal mind is? On the 19th of January this year, a Taiwanese man passed away after he played video games for three days without eating or drinking or sleeping. And in the report, it said sadly at the end that he was the second person to die that month from excessive video gaming. Why do people do this to themselves, brothers and sisters? Why do people eat to excess, drink alcohol to excess, do drugs, base jump from high mountains, do all sorts of things to excess until they die? Why do we do this to ourselves? It's because, brothers and sisters, without God, 
in our lives, there's just this endless, fruitless search for pleasure, entertainment, and the indulgence of self. We're trying to fill a hole and and we're trying to satisfy a need that only God can fill and only God can satisfy. And if this mind is left unattended, unchallenged, unconfronted, it just grows and grows and grows until it is going to destroy itself. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, playing video games until you die. You'd think that you'd just break and eat and sleep and... No. The carnal mind is so strong, brothers and sisters, it will destroy itself. It will destroy itself. Our brain and our minds can become so hardened that it will only do what is good for itself. So what does, what does a hardened carnal mind look like? Well, in the few minutes that we have left, I just want to paint a portrait of the carnal mind. And if you go through the concordance and you look at the word mind, it's used a whole bunch of times. If I remember, 221 times. But very clearly, you can divide the way in which the word mind is used into carnal fleshly attributes and good spiritual attributes. We're going to look at those next time. But first tonight, what does the carnal mind look like? Well, I want you to come to Ephesians chapter 4. We don't have time to look up almost any of these uh, together. But we will read this one, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18. Well, let's actually read a few verses uh, before then. Verse, uh, let's read verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, In the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness." This is one of the attributes of the carnal mind. It alienates us and isolates us from almost everybody. Isaiah 59 and verse 1 says, Our sins have separated us from God. And the carnal mind is going to make us lonely. It's going to make us isolated from brothers and sisters, from each other, from our families, from God, from life. This verse says, they, their understanding is darkened and they're alienated from the life of God. They're alienated, Colossians says, to the point where they are enemies of God. And if you go to uh, Ezekiel 23, which we won't do, but in a series of verses in Ezekiel 23 that talk about their minds, the minds of Israel being alienated, the margin has disjointed, disconnected. We're isolating ourselves when we exercise the carnal mind from others and from God, and even from ourselves. A carnal mind is hardened and proud. That's what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar. Your mind is hardened by pride. Colossians 2 says, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. We're we're lifted up in in pride. That's the carnal mind. Titus 1 in verse 15 talks about a mind that is impure and defiled. It says, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. We're going to look at that more in our next class. We can be angry and hostile. We read that in our reading tonight, warring against the law of our mind, evil affected, uh, Acts 14 says. We can be given to excess and greed. We just read that in Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4 says, you think it's, they think it's strange that you don't run to the same excess of riot when you don't have their mind. We can be progressively corrupted of the truth. 
I was going to look up these passages, but let me just uh, tell you that um, there's a progressive corruption when it comes to the truth by the carnal mind. Firstly, it starts out in 2 Corinthians 11 that, that, that we say to ourselves, well, it's, just not, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's not really the simplicity of the mind of Christ. It's complicated. There's more than one truth. Then, as we just read before in First of, uh, or sorry, in First of Timothy six, we find that people with this corrupt mind are destitute of the truth. So we go from thinking there's more than one truth to having no truth. And lastly, as we just read in Second Timothy three, we resist the truth. This is the progression of the carnal mind. We can be blinded and deceived. Isaiah 44 has deluded. We can be doubtful and anxious. Luke 12 verse 29 says in the margin, live not in careful suspense. A doubtful mind, brothers and sisters, is a corrupt and carnal mind. God has given us full assurance of faith. If we have doubts, it's the carnal mind in us. We just read, vain and empty in the vanity of their mind. Ezekiel 36 talks about a mind that's spiteful and cruel. Nehemiah 9 and Isaiah 7 talks about a mind that's forgetful, unmindful of God. And lastly, we have the double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways, the man who's easily shaken, the man who's weary, who's faint, who's unsettled, who's restless. This is the carnal mind, brothers and sisters, and it leads, as we read, only to death. When we feel like this, when we feel these things, when we feel isolated, when we feel angry, greedy, doubtful, anxious, mean, restless, these are all attributes of the carnal mind. It's horrible, brothers and sisters. Who wants this? Jeremiah calls this the heart of man that is desperately sick. Who can know it? Well, brothers and sisters, God does. God does. Look at these three references. Sorry to take that down, but look at these three references from the, the, uh, the scriptures. This is a lovely phrase. For I know the things that come into your mind. Every one of them. Our God knows what's in our mind, brothers and sisters. He knows the things that come into our mind. He says in the Proverbs, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? God God knows our minds, how they work, how they function. And lastly, in the final conflagration of Gog, it will come to pass at that time that things will come into Gog's mind, God says, and he will think an evil thought. God knows our minds, brothers and sisters. He knows our problem. And he's provided the answer. Because if you're still in Ephesians, just come back one chapter to Ephesians chapter 2 and read these words with me in Ephesians 2 verses 12 to 17. That at that time... Ye were without Christ, being aliens, alienated, isolated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the carnal mind, brothers and sisters. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so bringing peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. We, brothers and sisters, are those that are afar off. And how grateful are we that God has the solution to the enmity that's going on inside our minds. That God set there since the days of Genesis. He's solved the problem, brothers and sisters. He's abolished the enmity. 
He has the solution. He's solved the fighting. He's won the battle. And he's going to share that victory with us one day. In the complete sense. He'll take away our carnal mind. But in the meantime, as we struggle on in life, he has promised us a measure of victory over the carnal mind even now. Look what we read in verse 14. For he is our peace. Verse 15, so making peace. Verse 17, he came and preached peace. And what is peace, brothers and sisters, if it's an absence of war? There's no longer a battle. There's no longer hostility, antagonism. There's no longer a war. Our God has promised peace. And how thankful we ought to be. We'll look at this next time, but there's a lovely little phrase in Philippians 4 and verse 7, reading from the Rotherham's version. It talks about the peace of God that rises above every mind. The peace of God which rises above every mind. We've got this carnal mind, brothers and sisters. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But how thankful we ought to be that our Lord Jesus Christ has come, crushed serpent thinking at its source, and provided us with the victory and with peace. And in our next class, we want to look at God's solution to the carnal mind. Our nobler portion, if you like. Our hope, God's answer, his promise, the mind of the Spirit.